Hello everyone, it's Eric from Stanford University, and as you probably know, in this video, I'll be talking about EKGs. I've had a lot of requests from viewers and from my students for a summary of my systematic approach to interpreting an EKG. That is, when I pick up an EKG to read it, where do I start? Now to be honest, I estimate I've read several thousand EKGs over the, over the last decade, and I personally no longer strictly adhere to a systematic method. However, I definitely recommend doing so when first starting out, or you're guaranteed to occasionally miss critical diagnoses. So what approach do I recommend? Well, if you're a typical medical, nursing, PA, or paramedic student who has had any prior exposure to EKGs, you've probably heard the following sequence before. Rate, rhythm, axis, hypertrophy, and infarction. This specific series of words gets repeated in medical school and hospital rounds so often it feels like a mantra. Have you ever wondered where it comes from? I'm not positive of the origin of this approach, but I am sure of why it's become so ubiquitous. It's on account of this book, which is by far the most popular book in the world on EKG interpretation. Unfortunately, despite its popularity, it's also not very good and its general approach frames and organizes the interpretation in a way which is illogical and encourages bad habits. Therefore, I recommend something different. My approach has three steps. Number one, assess the rhythm, which will incorporate a measure of the rate since the rate does not stand in isolation from the rhythm. Number two, assess the QRS complex, meaning both the axis and the QRS morphology. And number three, assess the ST segments T waves and QT interval, since abnormalities of these have strongly overlapping etiologies and physical appearance. This may seem superficially similar to Dubin's approach. However, this one focuses on individual waveform abnormalities instead of diagnoses. Among multiple benefits of this are that you won't forget that changes in the waveforms can be caused by things other than hypertrophy and infarction. I'm going to walk you through this approach one step at a time and one sub-step at a time. Please be aware that I'll be assuming some basic knowledge of EKGs already. So if you've come here not knowing the difference between a P wave and QRS complex, or not knowing the difference between limb leads and precordial leads, you probably will want to look at some of my other EKG videos first and then come back. I've also embedded annotations that will link to other videos on specific diagnoses when relevant. Step one, which is the longest and most complicated of the three steps, I've broken down into five parts. First, measure the rate and determine if it's normal, tachycardic, or bradycardic. For adults, the normal resting heart rate is 50 to 90 beats per minute and not 60 to 100. The fact that most people think it's 60 to 100 is very frustrating and can be detrimental. For example, I've seen patients refer to cardiologists for asymptomatic heart rates in the 50s, which is completely unnecessary. And for anyone who is skeptical of this range, consider that one of the four criteria for the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or SIRS, is a heart rate greater than 90, which would be a strange criteria if heart rates in the 90s were normal. Some pearls about the heart rate. The maximum predicted sinus rate is approximately 220 minus the patient's age. There are some exceptions to this, particularly among world-class elite athletes, but if you see an 80-year-old patient with a heart rate of 170, you can be very sure that it's not sinus tachycardia. And a heart rate of 140 to 150 beats per minute specifically suggests the possibility of atrial flutter with 2 to 1 AV block. 2 to 1 AV block means that for every two waves of depolarization, which reach the AV node, only one passes through to depolarize the ventricles. If you have no idea what atrial flutter with 2 to 1 AV block looks like, we're going to see some examples of uh, A flutter in a few minutes. Next, determine if the rhythm is regular, regularly irregular, or irregularly irregular. If you're not familiar with those terms, those latter two may sound a bit strange. So here are some examples. First, you can already probably recognize a regular rhythm as such. Formally, a regular rhythm is one in which the RR interval is consistent from one beat to the next. 
Here's an example of a regularly irregular rhythm. The RR interval varies, but does so in a repeating pattern. Finally, in an irregularly irregular rhythm, there is no pattern. QRS complexes seem to come at random and unpredictable intervals. Excluding those which are exceedingly rare, there are essentially seven different irregular rhythms. I am not going to review these individually in significant detail here, as they will be the topics of additional forthcoming videos. Sinus arrhythmia, in which P waves are originating from the sinus node, but just at irregular intervals, often from primary sinus node dysfunction, can cause an irregularly irregular rhythm that can be slow, fast, or at a normal rate. Atrial fibrillation is the classic cause of an irregularly irregular rhythm. Atrial flutter most commonly displays fixed AV conduction, that is, every second or every fourth flutter wave is conducted, resulting in a regular rhythm. However, sometimes AV conduction can lack any discernible pattern and the rhythm will be irregularly irregular. There is one interesting pattern that atrial flutter can experience in which 2 to 1 AV conduction alternates with 4 to 1 conduction in a very repetitive fashion, resulting in a regularly irregular rhythm with an overall heart rate of about 100. Multifocal atrial tachycardia, in which three or more distinctly different irritable atrial foci are all firing at seemingly random intervals, results in an irregularly irregular tachycardia. While first and third degree AV block results in regular rhythms, second degree AV block results in irregular ones. Type 1, also known as Wenckebach AV block, results in a regularly irregular rhythm, while type 2 results in an irregularly irregular one. Note that type 2 second degree block is not seen in tachycardias. Finally, the collection of very similar rhythms of atrial bigeminy and trigeminy and ventricular bigeminy and trigeminy cause regularly irregular rhythms. Here are just two examples of the more unusual of the aforementioned rhythms. First, atrial flutter with alternating 2 to 1 and 4 to 1 conduction. And then ventricular bigeminy, in which every normal sinus beat is immediately followed by a PVC, which then blocks the subsequent sinus beat from occurring. In ventricular trigeminy, um, you have two sinus beats followed by a PVC, then two sinus beats followed by a PVC. Um, but otherwise looks very similar. After rate and regularity, the next parameter to assess is whether the QRS complex is narrow or wide. A narrow complex is one in which the width is under 120 milliseconds or three small boxes. A wide complex is 120 milliseconds or greater. Regarding the etiologies of a wide complex, uh, common ones include bundle branch block, a ventricular origin of the rhythm, as in ventricular tachycardia shown here, left ventricular hypertrophy, and a pacemaker. Uncommon etiologies include class 1A and 1C antiarrhythmics, the Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern, which we'll see later, and profound hyperkalemia. Evaluate the atrial activity. Specifically, look for P waves. If they're there, what is their morphology? Sinus P waves should be upright in lead 1 and down in AVR. If they do not display this polarity, it strongly suggests that the origin of the P waves is somewhere other than the sinus node. When looking at P wave morphology, also take a moment to look for evidence of atrial enlargement. If there are no P waves, look to see if there are fibrillation waves, which are typically very small amplitude, irregular undulations in the baseline, or if there are flutter waves, typically described as sawtoothed and easiest to see in the inferior leads or occasionally in lead V1. The final part of the assessment of the rhythm is to identify the relationship between atrial and ventricular activity. For example, is the PR interval normal at between 120 and 200 milliseconds? Is it short or is it prolonged? A PR interval that is consistently above 200 milliseconds is indicative of first degree AV block by definition. Also look to see if the PR interval changes 
um, and if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between P waves and QRS complexes. And if there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence, if there is any association between the two at all. Here's an example of, of a changing PR interval due to type 1 second degree AV block. You may also notice that there are more P waves than QRS complexes since every third P wave does not get conducted. Here's an example of fixed 2 to 1 AV block, which may be either type 1 or type 2. And the last, here is an example of complete dissociation of P waves and QRS complexes as a consequence of third degree AV block, also called complete heart block. Also ask if the P waves come before or after the QRS complexes with which they are associated. Although it's uncommon to see P waves following the complexes, it can occur in a select few types of supraventricular tachycardias, such as one called orthodromic AV reentrant tachycardia, shown here. Noticing these retrograde P waves, which occur after the QRS and are inverted, will help to suggest an otherwise difficult to make diagnosis. So in summary, when assessing the rhythm, first measure the rate, then determine if the rhythm is regular, regularly irregular, or irregularly irregular. Determine if the QRS complex is narrow or wide. Evaluate the atrial activity. And finally, identify the relationship between atrial and ventricular activity. Going through these five components to rhythm assessment thoughtfully and deliberately will result in an accurate diagnosis of the rhythm for all but the most unusual and difficult of EKGs. Let's move on to step two, assess the QRS axis and morphology. So first here is the axis. A normal QRS axis for an adult is between negative 30 and positive 90. It is not zero to 90, as commonly claimed by dubious medical texts and various internet sites. The etiologies of axis deviation are many. Right axis deviation can be a normal variant in children and young thin adults, RVH, COPD in the absence of RVH, left posterior fasicular block, a lateral wall MI, an ectopic ventricular rhythm, or the Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern. Left axis deviation has analogous etiologies, normal variant in older obese adults, LVH, an elevated diaphragm for any reason, such as marked ascites or pregnancy, left anterior fasicular block, an inferior MI, an ectopic ventricular rhythm, and once again, WPW. Then look at the QRS morphology. When looking at the morphology, there are five to six key diagnoses to look for. First, pathologic Q waves, which are usually indicative of a prior MI. Look for evidence of ventricular hypertrophy. And if the QRS complex is wide for a bundle branch block. Consider whether the pattern has low voltage, that is, if the amplitude of every QRS complex is unusually low. Etiologies of this usually involve some insulating material or substance coming between the heart's conduction system and the electrodes on the skin. Moving outside in, this includes excessive adipose tissue in obesity, excessive air and hyperinflation from COPD, pleural or pericardial effusions, and infiltrative diseases of the myocardium, such as amyloidosis and sarcoidosis. Finally, through a mechanism unknown to me, hypothyroidism can also cause low voltage. Although it's rare, electrical alternance is an important diagnosis to be aware of. It's characterized by alternating amplitude of the various waveforms, usually most prominent in the QRS complexes. When the entire 12 lead EKG is available, one can actually see large alternating shifts in the QRS axis. This usually indicates the presence of a large pericardial effusion um, and is caused by the heart literally shifting back and forth uh, in this big ball of fluid, though this does not necessarily uh, indicate pericardial tamponade. The last major morphologic abnormality of the QRS to look for is delta waves. These are an initial shallow upstroke before each QRS complex, 
that results in a technically widened QRS complex and usually, though not always, a short PR interval. Delta waves are indicative of an accessory pathway. An accessory pathway is an abnormal tract of conductive myocardium that connects the atria to the ventricles without needing to pass through the AV node. Thus, these are also sometimes referred to as bypass tracts. On EKG, the presence of delta waves, QRS widening, and a short PR interval is collectively known as the Wolf-Parkinson-White pattern, and when it's associated with paroxysmal tachycardias, it's called the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. On to step three, Assess the ST segments, T waves, and QT interval. The first thing to look for is ST elevation, which is generally only notable if the elevation is one millimeter or more in at least two anatomically contiguous leads. By far the most well-known etiology of ST elevation is an ST elevation MI. However, there are many more, most notable of which are left bundle branch block, left ventricular hypertrophy, and a normal variant frequently called early repolarization. The elevations seen with these three are usually limited to leads V1 through V3. The remaining causes include pericarditis, an LV aneurysm, vasospasm, severe hyperkalemia, hypothermia, an inherited sodium channel defect called Brugada syndrome, and a rare cause of acute heart failure called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy frequently referred to in the American press as broken heart syndrome. Of almost equal importance is ST depression. The most notable cause here is again either coronary ischemia or infarction. Other causes include tachycardia, even in the absence of ischemia, digoxin, even at therapeutic doses, hypokalemia, bundle branch blocks, and ventricular hypertrophy. ST depression, due to the last two, are usually referred to as secondary repolarization abnormalities since the reason that the sequence of repolarization is abnormal is the abnormality in depolarization. The others are referred to as primary repolarization abnormalities. When we look at inverted T waves and their etiologies, the interesting and helpful thing is that the list is nearly identical to that of ST depressions. There are just a couple of rare additions, intracranial hemorrhage, late stage pericarditis, and hypothyroidism. Remember that isolated T wave inversions in leads 3, AVR, and V1 are common and normal. Aside from T wave inversions, the only other significant T wave abnormality to look for is to see if they are peaked, which suggests hyperkalemia. An acute STEMI can occasionally cause a similar morphology of the T wave very early on before the development of ST elevation. This is usually called a hyperacute T wave and is rare to see because usually the patient experiencing the MI has already transitioned to the ST elevation phase by the time he or she is seen by medical personnel. The very last component to consciously examine on a typical EKG is the QT interval keeping in mind that the QT interval should be corrected for the heart rate. Although there is an equation to do this, as a quick rule of thumb, the QT interval should be less than one half the RR interval. Etiologies of a prolonged QT include congenital long QT syndrome, a relatively long list of medications, and all of the hypos, that is hypocalcemia, hypothyroidism, and hypothermia. A number of resources list hypokalemia also as a cause of prolonged QT, but the most authoritative of sources suggest that this is erroneous. The confusion regarding QT prolongation and hypokalemia arises for two reasons. First, when the U wave becomes prominent, as it can in hypokalemia, there can be fusion of the T and U waves, and when measuring the QT interval, one can inadvertently measure the QU interval instead, which will necessarily be longer. The second reason for the confusion is that hypokalemia is particularly dangerous when superimposed on pre-existing QT prolongation, which is independent of the electrolyte disorder.
An unusually short QT interval is also a pathologic finding, albeit an extremely rare one. The etiologies of this are hypercalcemia and the very rare congenital short QT syndrome. Both long QT and short QT syndromes are associated with an increased risk of sudden cardiac death. So that's the grand summary of my systematic approach to the EKG. If you found that I went through some of the examples very quickly, or you want to know more about the EKG features of some of the aforementioned abnormalities, you may want to view my specific topic videos listed here. Please remember to like or share this video if you found it helpful or interesting, and feel free to leave questions or comments.